La narration moderne s'imagine que le fantasme de pouvoir féministe, c'est survivre à l'assaut sexuel, alors qu'en réalité, ce serait plutôt de ne pas en avoir à s'en préoccuper du tout. So, to give a brief rundown of the timeline for the attempted Xena Warrior Princess reboot, it goes like this. The new series was officially announced in August of 2015, with writer Javier Grillo Markswatch officially at the helm by December of the same year. The writer continued to do interviews and press for the series throughout 2016, but in April of 2017, it was officially announced that the showrunner and studio had parted ways due to creative differences, and that the reboot itself was confirmed as cancelled that August. September of the next year saw the writer make a podcast appearance where, for the first time, he gave some insight into his vision for the first season. And finally, an undated script for the proposed pilot episode leaked online in October of 2018. The quote-unquote revised network pitch that we are here to talk about today is dated all the way back to December of 2015, and therefore almost certainly predates that leaked pilot script. So, here we go. One final deep dive into the world of the Xena reboot that never was. And, as always, these are just our dumb opinions, also spoilers. If you would like to see the reboot pilot script discussed from start to end in excruciating detail, that video already exists, but in brief summary... Xena. She's in Xena, the warrior. Okay. But, which Xena is but like Xena's a gladiator. Xena's a fierce bitch. Yeah, a fierce like, gladiator, like... A goddess. Yeah, Roman, And this is yeah. giving me, like... I don't even know what this is giving me. It's not giving me much. The pilot episode gives us a Xena who acts as right-hand woman and lover to an evil Hercules, completing his famous labors for him while he gets the credit. When they clash over the attempted assault of a prisoner and her children, Hercules beats the shit out of her and leaves her for dead. Xena is found and nursed back to health by Gabrielle, an aspiring bard and the daughter of a Scythian blacksmith. Xena trains Gabrielle to fight, all the while getting herself back into fighting shape so that she can go get revenge on Hercules. The Scythian king shows up, announces that Gabrielle is the doppelganger of his missing daughter, and asks her to come with him in order to pose as the lost princess and marry a neighboring lord, for the sake of a political alliance. Xena watches in disgust while Gabrielle agrees to essentially sacrifice her happiness to save her people, and rides off. But upon discovering that Hercules and his army are about to lay waste to the Scythian capital, Xena returns to rescue Gabrielle. Arriving just as the attack begins, they reunite, but she's unable to save Gabrielle from being kidnapped, and the episode ends with Xena swearing, both to the Scythian king and to Gabrielle's father, that she will find and rescue Gabrielle from her fate. According to extraneous information gleaned from various interviews, the majority of season one would have focused on Xena's mission to rescue Gabrielle, who by the time they met up again would be a bit brainwashed, and several episodes would be focused on Gabrielle healing and truly becoming her old self again. From all the research I've done, it seems that the Screen Raider had only the best of intentions at heart and should be treated with respect accordingly. There were also several elements of the reboot script that I enjoyed, including the majority of Gabrielle's characterization and a few funny moments between the leads. But I do believe that several elements of the reboot script would also possibly have been controversial for fans of the original series. In no particular order, these elements include Xena working for Hercules rather than operating independently, Hercules is an unrelentingly evil character. Xena's history is someone who purposely has killed children on purpose. Xena's orphan status, erasing her unique relationship with her mother. Xena's former slave status that may or may not have implied a history of sexual assault in her childhood. Xena's general presentation as a person who doesn't know how to solve problems without using violence. Gendered violence and or sexual assault used as explicit or implied threat at least half a dozen times in the first episode. A take on gendered violence that rendered nearly every male character an active or complicit rapist. Gabrielle's sudden willingness to abandon a city under siege in order to save herself. The OG series adventure story about two women who chose of their own free will to travel the world together being reshaped into a story about two women who are forced together by acts of violence and sexual violence, a general lack of agency among the female characters, Hercules calling Xena a whore and her not immediately cutting his head off, Hercules threatening to slap Xena and her not immediately cutting his head off. Opinions, of course, may vary. I am fierce, ferocious, and ready for battle. I am the warrior princess. <laughs> 
As I mentioned, it's likely that this pitch from December of 2015 predates the full pilot script that was leaked in October of 2018. The pitch is dated to the same month that a writer for the project was first publicly announced, and differs from the full pilot script in several major ways, suggesting that the two are separated by months of edits, and, potentially though not definitively, influence from other writers, from producers, or from the network. This is not unusual when it comes to a television project or any collaborative art form, but it raises an interesting possibility that one of these documents is closer to the writer's original and uninfluenced concept for the series, and one reflects changes and suggestions brought on by outside forces, especially given the fact that creative differences were eventually cited as reason for the writer's departure from the project. But this is pure conjecture, and knowing very little of what went on behind the scenes between 2015 and 2017, I will leave you to make your own assumptions. So buckle up, and as in the last video, content warning for frank discussion of sexual assault and child abuse. Before we get into this, I want to say this. I will not hear any rumors that I am being biased. I am going to be completely unbiased. I just want to throw that out there. It seems like you're going to be biased. We only get one shot at this. Xena, Warrior Princess, occupies a unique spot in pop culture. It is a beloved yet dormant franchise. Xena's fans form a loyal and still very demographically desirable cult audience. Whatever that means. <laughs> demographically desirable at that point in time. Bro, if we make Xena, you know some chicks are gonna watch it. Like <laughs> The gays want this show. We're a desirable demographic, you guys. A lesbian nerd, man. Love being demographically <laughs> desirable. This was definitely right after gay marriage had been passed. I can tell that right now. And the name recognition is massive. As the industry has now learned from properties that have been rebooted and re-rebooted to fair to middling results, you only get one chance to come back a beloved title with both the glow of nostalgia and the shock of the new on your side. I'm thinking timeline-wise, this is like season five-ish of Game of Thrones is airing now? Yeah, so it was the same year that Mad Max Fury Road came out. Would have been about five years into Game of Thrones. We're in an era right now, especially with like Marvel shows and stuff, where they're like, they're, like that's the idea. It's like, we have a name recognition, so let's go on that without even trying to build anything else. <laughs> the thing, if this is 2015... Yeah. It's just had Star Wars and Jurassic World be huge reboots. Ooh. Would this be the year where they had just announced Tom Holland as Spider-Man? I think so, yeah. It has to be special. It has to be different enough to make its own mark. And it has to be similar enough to appeal to the original fan base. Like, we saw fucking Last Airbender come out. Yeah. And how much that ruined everybody. Yeah. And everybody already got so excited again for the new one. Yeah. And now we're also kind of seeing it happen again. I'm ready to get hurt again. This is a chance to make Xena into a cultural event by delivering not just the fun and action and adventure, but also a restatement of the original's most daring virtues in a grander, more epic package. And, of course, at the end of this limited series, the field will be left wide open for many, many more adventures. Not that I would know, but like this sounds like a very effective pitch to me. And clearly it works yeah. because this is the year that the series was was ordered. Mm -hmm. They're making a very good case for mm -hmm. acknowledging roots, acknowledging where it came from. Very indirectly about like it being such a queer icon, especially for mm -hmm. like Xena as a person exemplified a lot of things on like what it means to be on the spectrum of gender and gender like mm -hmm. showing, right? A new approach to Xena. The original Xena was magical, anarchical, and anachronistic. It told the story of a woman with a very dark past, finding redemption in a lawless land, accompanied only by her best friend, Gabrielle, a woman who proved a voice of goodness and morality while realizing her own arc from naive girl to fully realized, empowered woman. It told case of the week stories with strong moral lessons, occasionally hilarious comedic interludes, and a recurring cast of gods, monsters, and wizards taken from an international catalog of myths. And it was beautiful. Xena, Warrior Princess, does not need to be remade in its old image because what it did, it already did to perfection. I will not argue. 
<laughs> of course you won't. What's, what was considered, like, radical and new wave and, like, boundary pushing back yeah. then is obviously not the same now. So how do um, you do this for, like, a new generation? Yeah. And I kind of don't think you can. The conclusion that I mostly come to at the end of this is, well, you could at least try to not make it worse. <laughs> the purpose of this reboot is to take those archetypal characters and their classic arcs, redemption and empowerment, and put them in a world closer to that of Game of Thrones, Rome, Gladiator, and, most recently, Mad Max Fury Road. I understand why that would sound cool, but it would inherently mean such a massive tonal shift. Stupid. It's a terrible idea. So bad. That's like so stupid. They were like, could we take like the fun, quirky, like fantasy elements of Xena and completely eliminate them into something that makes you sad? I would like to see a Xena that has a higher rating, not in the sense that there's blood and gore, but that in the sense that like if you stab somebody, the sword's not magically clean after. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So I guess if we have to go back to the the point that they're saying it in 2015 that was before game of thrones was kind of like not good yeah. but it still yeah. makes me think like oh do we want to do that i from from what i understand about Zena, is like it was violent or like it there was it was more like action packed yeah. but it wasn't it wasn't graphic it wasn't ultimately like this Zena thing it's kind of a kid friendly or yeah i used to watch Zena with my grandparents i don't think there's a single episode of game of thrones that you would say is like family friendly the episode at winterfell the long night you can watch with your grandparents because you can't fucking see anything Xena is inherently campy. Once again, kind of going back to how like it plays on gender roles. That's a huge part of the camp factor of it. Did Xena have its like dark episodes? Yes. Xena and Gabrielle literally getting crucified like stays in your head, you know? <laughs> but once again, like a large part of it was campy comedy. Yeah, I think it's a genuine question. Is there a point to still calling it Xena if it's played 100% serious? Even putting Game of Thrones Rome on Gladiator alongside Mad Max Fury Road, it, it already tells you that they don't really understand what made those properties so big, especially Mad Max. Yeah, that's an interesting point because they're both like quite, they're both dark, quote unquote, but they had very different perspectives on how to handle those dark subjects. Why? because Warner Brothers isn't putting Charlie's Theron in the Mad Max sequels, because Disney can't make a Black Widow movie, even though she's a lead in the Avengers movies. Um, they're now making a Furiosa movie, and we did get a Black Widow yes. movie, but yeah. at the time that this was stated, I, I, I see where they're coming from. It was, it was an underrepresentation, and it still very much is. Yes. Yeah. The world of action and honor, forged in battle, and victories that change the course of human history, keeps working under the perception that a male lead is the only marketable option. We are sending Xena to take it back. I'm on board so far. Yes. Correct. Great okay. pitch. We're done. Yes. <laughs> Print. I feel like this is very well written to, like, pitch for like this particular like stuff that was going on at the time where the Marvel movies were big and everyone was like, oh, but why can't we even get a Black Widow? Like it's using the same specific examples that like activism was using at the time. And I feel like that was very calculated and smart. She's a truly universal hero whose arc is all about the heart. And she was a pioneer as a complicated multi-dimensional series lead. Like the thing is, on paper, this pitch sounds so, like, compelling. And I would actually love to see this version of Xena. But, but like, they didn't write they that. They didn't write that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get there. The subtext can now be the text. The subtext was the perception, never confirmed, but always implied, that Xena and Gabrielle were more than just friends and companions. The purpose of this reboot is to honor the subtext and all it accomplished by telling the story of that romance as the true dramatic arc of Xena and Gabrielle. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Let them be gay. Yeah. Sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if we were all like, no, I disapprove. Yeah, I think they should stay in the closet, y'all.
Yeah, it would be nice, but people would still like freak out. It I guess it depends. Yeah. Because like I remember when the Star Wars, like the the last one, when everyone freaked out because there was like one gay kiss and they had to like remove it in certain countries. This this kind of sounds the way you like you would have pitched our flag means death, honestly. Like the having brought that up before, I'm like, no, that's kind of that pitch of like it's campy, but it's still got this heart to it, and yeah. yeah. Be gay, do crimes. Mm-hmm. Especially starting off, Zena, yeah, she was on her path to redemption, mm-hmm. but it's not like she was this, like, hero she figure. She killed people. She's a character archetype. So one of the, the historical figures I'm most fascinated by is Alexander the Great, and I think that he and Zena are the same archetype, and it's an archetype that I've named, mm-hmm. and I call it War Crimes Horse Girl. And I think... (laughs) Can I lump in Achilles with that? Yes! The world. Behind the myth. Imagine, then, that the original Xena is the legend, full of gods and demigods and monsters and magic. The reboot will be the real story. In this reboot, the monsters roam the human soul rather than the countryside. Uh, That's weird. I don't a shame magic because like with magic you can be way more creative but okay i was hoping it was going to be like the witcher like a monster of the week type of thing i remember a lot of people saying when the witcher came out oh this is just this is xena and gabrielle but gender swapped like the witcher and yaskier it's like the whole point of it. <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> it's not the whole point but it's like this is like when they were like oh these comics are just the myths of what we did or whatever and like a lot of people thought that was a cool idea but i was like but is it like that's that's what most of us found that's how most of us discovered this anyways was the sillier version you know like the comical the amp I think this is a very subjective thing, though. Like, I think some people would be really into this. And you know what this also sounds like to me? Like, the monsters aren't the monsters. This was also at the height of The Walking Dead. Okay. I guess that's also The Last of Us, right? That's the, like, you don't ever really think of the clickers. Like, the clickers are... The clickers are an obstacle, but they're not the antagonist. You know what made Percy Jackson popular? The fact that it had Greek gods. We should just eliminate all of them. Like, what are you talking about? That's one of the big draws. Why would you take that out? That's such a bad idea. No one wants that. I take back what I said about the pitch being, like, compelling. Now that you (laughs) you just scroll, I take it back. I think it has compelling aspects. I think it could be done compellingly, but there didn't. So there's a podcast that I listen to. And one of the things that they say sometimes is like, look, like if we hear a pitch, it's like, look, anything could be good. Like, I'm not going to say this will be terrible. Anything could be good, but this won't be. We'll say anything could be good, including this. Not this though. Including. Wow. I got to stop saying that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get that it's smart as far as pitching something, but why would this make a good type of setting for a Xena thing? I think that actually that's a good question. And I think that probably what was happening is that there was a market for we want to like exploit a familiar franchise. What gay shows can we use a familiar franchise to like make seem sellable to the network, regardless of whether or not it actually works with the franchise? I feel like that might be why it's like not really like the script wasn't really that related to Xena. (laughs) For example, we've all heard of Hercules. Our Hercules is a ruthless military general whose legend is a carefully crafted public relations story designed to make him more fearsome. Mm, I don't like it. No, thanks. Can we go back to like the magical (laughs) fighting? (laughs) I already am like, no. I think that works if his people that he's a general of all believe in the myth. Because then you can Ooh. you can do that contemporary thing of the like the leader that's, you know, controlling his populace through lies and all that and like Obviously at the time I'm wholeheartedly able to believe that uh, you know, if Hercules did exist. Mm-hmm. His legend would be bigger than, than the bigger real. than him. Yeah, I think in a weird way, 
<laughs> they kind of did already tackle this in Xena. Uh-huh. Joxer. Joxer. Joxer literally made his whole image beforehand be Joxer the <laughs> mighty rope to the countryside. Our uber villain is the guy who sent Hercules on his legendary journeys, the now mythical King Eurystheus. We'll call him Eurus. He's a warmongering demagogue who rules over a Bronze Age Greece much different from the birthplace of democracy. Now, historically speaking, look, I know that they they said like this is this isn't this, this isn't a documentary, but they've said that it's more historically grounded. You can't see the face that I'm making when you started with <laughs> historically speaking. <laughs> I just, I just need to. Okay, so King Eurystheus in in mythology, he was either the king of Tyrans, Tyrans of the Great Walls, or um, um, Argos, which is all nearby, and it all would have been nearby Mycenae, which would have been. Um, it, they were we're calling this Bronze Age Greece, so this would have been like. Trojan War era Greece, um, meaning Mycenae was the lead local power at the time. Um, this is more than 500 years prior, like what the events of 300 and the Persian Wars. This is way before Athenian democracy. This is like seven, eight hundred years before Alexander the Great. So we're talking about Bronze Age Greece, and then we're talking about Athens which existed at the time, but was not the dominant local power. Like the Athens that we know from classical Greece came hundreds and hundreds of years later. I think they're doing it for like name recognition, because if they said any other yeah. like city in Greece, people would be like, mm, okay. But if you're like, oh, Athens, then it's like, oh, okay, I know that. So I'm now invested. They've just used Athens for name recognition and put like the king in the wrong city in the wrong era. And it doesn't matter. It's not a documentary. It's fine. I'm fine about it. I'm just saying. We can tell that you're really fine. You're doing great. You don't sound fine about it, Emily. <laughs> you're nailing it, buddy. But I do agree. They sort of like put in there like, oh, we're so much more real. So I think you're right. And you should talk shit. I think but they, what they mean by more realistic is just like violent and dark and sad and miserable. <laughs> yeah, and oh, unless they like introduce time travel, right? Because that's what they're trying to do. Like just like <laughs> bring in things that did not happen at all at that time, but make it seem like it did. So they should just also say, yes, this is serious and grounded world. But also sometimes she has like a time traveling portal. Don't don't think about it. <laughs> Our Athens is a male-dominated boomtown where women have no role other than wife, slave, or whore. Why? Wow. <laughs> okay. That's not great. Wh why? There's a part of me that wishes that rhymed a little bit better. Because we've got wife and whore. There's like two W's. Like, they should have come up with another W. It doesn't help <laughs> the situation, but at least, like, mentally... <laughs> It would be like, oh, that's the, at least they were going for some sort of alliteration thing. It's really interesting um, which things they decide to make more real and which things they decide to take um, liberties with. So historically speaking. Go ahead. We know you want to say it. Hit it. Take it away. Life for women in Athens. Like, obviously, Xena was not a universe. The OG Xena was not a universe where women had no role other than wife, slave, or whore. And in historical Athens, like, being a woman sucked you know you didn't have a lot of agency generally you didn't have a, whatever but like also reducing it to just this it's overly simplistic and i know this is just a pitch i know this is not an essay on the world that they're building but like they're reducing even historical athens to something less complex than it necessarily was the whole point of xena is that it's it's like it's the fantasy we want it's what we want to see for a female lead like they're taking that out of it they're stripping it all out and making it just another horror show for women but literally like whole xena's whole thing was sisters are doing it for themselves like yeah in the original xena it's not like she was the only one with power like she wasn't 
constantly just finding these women to be damsels. She, like, that happens, but it wasn't, it wasn't the purpose of the whole show. It's warlike, atavistic, and very dangerous. Our reinvented Xena doesn't face giants and use magic. She is a warrior who grew up with clashing city-states and rampant slavery, where kill or be killed was the everyday reality for most people, and where life was, as Thomas Hobbes summed it up, nasty, brutish, and short, and where the gods and magic of myth exist only as fictions designed to inspire fear, and also, sometimes, hope. Now, here are a few words you haven't heard and won't hear in the next 15 minutes. Gritty, grim, brooding, dire, depressing. So this is this is also interesting insight to the industry because <laughs> it means that 2015 networks were already fucking sick of getting pitched the next Game of Thrones. They yeah. were already sick, like they, they wanted the next Game of Thrones, but they were already sick of getting pitched. Like everything was like, this is gritty, grim and depressing. Oh yeah, definitely. There was a time when like every show was like, oh, this is like The Office, but Game of Thrones. <laughs> this is like, what if Game of Thrones was set in the hood? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> One point was like, okay, guys. Right. But then why? But that's what it's, it's doing. It. He's just saying it's like playing taboo. It's like saying I'm gonna do this thing, but I'm not gonna use the words to describe exactly what I'm doing. But here's a word you will hear: a word that encompasses why we want to reboot Xena. Audacity. Mad Max Fury Road may have been set in a post-apocalyptic wasteland devoid of natural resources. But they still had a guy in a red leotard on top of a truck loaded with amps playing a fire-spewing electric guitar. That kind of rafters-swinging audacity is part of the fun and the spirit of the original Xena, especially as expressed in kick-ass fights that left the audience cheering. And that's what we want to keep. The head-butting, high-jumping, pole-twirling, arrow-from-mid-air snatching, sword-juggling awesomeness. That's the right track. And that's the, a great thing to pull from fury road other than just women being cool like it's like oh yeah. we like all of this other over the top ridiculousness as well yeah, yeah. no i re i do i do quite like that okay all yeah. right if there had been more of that in the script you know what sign me up but the yeah. only audacity that i can recall after the script was like the audacity to make xena boring Exactly. You are correct and you should say it. Tied to a more believable universe. I'm like, why do you want to take put it in a believable universe though? Like, sell me on that. You haven't sold me. Yeah, the audacity doesn't fit with it. Yeah, because exactly, because Mad Max didn't I don't think it was good, obviously, but it didn't take itself too serious. That's why they were able to put like the guy who is like whose sole job is to be the guitar hype man, like the the guy with the fire spewing electric guitar, is that's not grounded. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's not grounded. And, and 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 then the next paragraph, I was actually describing what fight scenes are in Xena to a friend the other day, and they are not grounded. It's like you know, four bad guys run up, and she does like. A 20 foot jump in the air and a flip what and lands much? on their shoulders and bangs their heads together. I mean, like, yes, that is the audacity that makes it fun and it's not grounded. That's the point. That's what they articulate in these two paragraphs. And yet. I'm just imagining you, like, squinting at the, the man in the red leotard on the truck with the amps playing a fire spewing an electric guitar and going, that's not grounded. <laughs> It's not <laughs> not historically accurate either. Once again, camp. Yeah. Like Mad Max, camp. Camp. Baby, baby. Camp. RuPaul Drag Race season four's post-apocalyptic jiggly caliente madness. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like it's camp, and there. Why? I I just don't under. And Mad Max is such a, it's so funny to me that they keep referencing it because it's such a perfect example of how to blend camp and blend serious tones together. Yeah. Yet for some reason, they're like, we don't want this to be camp. We want this to be serious like Game of Thrones because Game yeah. of Thrones is just not campy. 
Don't have a skinny, half-naked twink flailing off of a fucking car <laughs> and tell me that's not camp. Baby, 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 that's pride in the Pacific Northwest. Okay. Pilot episode. Overture. Establish a long-term story. Set Xena's arc of redemption and Gabrielle's arc of empowerment. Bro, I'm so ready right now. I'm ready for Gabrielle's hashtag arc of empowerment where she's like, <laughs> like brainwashed for like 12 of the 13 episodes or something. Meet our two lead characters. The rest will be recurring, which will make casting bigger names doable. The kind of bullshit you need to think of to like get your art made into reality. Yeah. The pilot story of the new Xena warrior princess. I thought this was about empowerment. <laughs> Why aren't we capitalizing princess? Begins somewhere in the countryside along the southern shores of the Black Sea. Now, historically speaking, tell us about geography. We are listening. I am doing chin hands in real life. So obviously, so south of the Black Sea, that's that's Turkey, modern day Turkey. That's the Anatolian Peninsula. And um, the west coast of that would have been where historical Troy was. So obviously, Bronze Age Greece would have had a certain amount of interaction through warfare or diplomacy or otherwise with this generalized area. Um, I don't know 100% for sure, but I think the major power in Anatolia at the time would have been the Hittite Empire. And we meet Xena the same way you might meet Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name, or Shane, or Gregory Peck in The Gunfighter, or Mad Max. A lone sword slinger wandering the countryside. And you love her because she's a badass. Yeah, in my mind, I'm just like, I can see the opening sequence of Mad Max. I can... I'm just going to put that in my head like because that's what they keep on saying 500 times. So now it's Xena and she's like, we're opening up with her like squishing a, a, a gecko. So that's where we are now. <laughs> but instead of the car next to Mad Max, it's a horse. It's just a <laughs> dusty horse. As our pilot begins, we see her enter an inn and a few bad dudes, professional thieves, give her shit for being a woman traveling alone in ancient Greece. It's interesting because there were a lot of times in Xena where she like, she would walk into a bar and a bunch of guys would like be gross and try to grope her and she'd beat the shit out of them and move on. Nice legs. So who do you think did it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that happens sometimes. But there was very rarely any like, you can't do that because you're a woman. Man, the gods don't care if these men live or die. Who is this woman? I've spent a lot of time healing on the battlefield. Am I supposed to believe some harlot knows more about healing than the priests of Asclepius? It, she's not doing the like, oh, I'm a strong woman and I'm going to prove it to you. Like, It's interesting that they're choosing this way to open open a series about her when a much more common theme in in the original show was that men respected her that she if she walked into a space usually either her reputation preceded her or she was one of the boys Lucentius, i'd like to meet a little friend of mine yes i know who you are xena xena this is xena with respect to your legendary ability xena the great warrior princess I'm honored. Isn't it great, Commander? Xena's fighting with us. We'll teach those barbarians a lesson now. You had power and nothing could stop you. People knew who you were. You commanded respect. What happened Where to you? You disappear. Then there's this talk all over the place that you've been working for peasants for no profit. All part of the cause, boys. My name is Xena. Xena? Xena of Corinth? The warrior princess of Kalmai? The one who defeated Callisto? You've heard of me. You must be Xena. Oh, you've heard of me. Oh, yes. They say you're a dangerous woman. Well, they're right. I mean, I like the idea of comparing it to, like, a Clint Eastwood. But it shouldn't... Mm. If you're gonna do that, don't then be like, Clint Eastwood, but girl. You know, like, don't you don't need the but girl part. Just, just be like, she's walking in like Clint Eastwood would. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah that's an intimidating presence. Yeah, like Obi Wan at the in the cantina in Star Wars. Like, there's so many things, and then she fucking yeah. cuts somebody's arm off, and you're just like, yeah. oh, <laughs> exactly. they could find any other reason, something that they would stop a guy for, or whatever. Yeah, 
somebody decides they don't like her face like you know how, how do bar fights start it could be a hundred things yeah like that can t- the cantina scene in star wars like it was just like oh i don't like your face and then like that's how things sort of escalated so it could be something like that it escalates into a fight and she kicks the shit out of them which leads to them making her a job offer i i understand that xena like is probably like a mercenary or whatever but i just don't know if even at that point in time i didn't watch the series if she would take a job for people who are explicitly like we don't respect you no that's a really good point she would think they were like not worth her time little pawn scum shit and she'd just have like they'd be unconscious and she'd be gone like yeah it's like she proved herself to them by beating them in a fight and then they offered her something and she's like "Ooh, yeah when she was a warlord she wanted to be in charge basically as much as possible and then once she turned good she would take like quote unquote jobs from but for like if they fit her moral values and it was like somebody that she wanted to help or someone who would ask for her help that's if you're for hire hey not that kind of hire gabrielle go on yeah, like that episode where she has to trade places with the princess and <laughs> the, the king is like, but if she survives to get married and lend slavery, and Dina's like, oh god, fine. <laughs> yeah, to help people, but not hired as like a mercenary. Yeah. And I don't even think in anything of like Xena's past, no. she was really hired as a mercenary either. It's... She just kind of like took what she wanted. Yeah, and, and I think hers. a lot of it's like, Imagine her taking someone else's orders. Yeah. Like, try to picture that. (laughs) They're about to raid a trade route and need muscle. What are her motivations as a character if she is... If she is the type of person who will attack a bunch of innocent people, but only do it because she's hired to? She agrees only to learn during the job that she is being set up for a bounty. She beat up all the people in that that bar, and then they were like, we want to hire you, and then we're like surprised Pikachu face when she beat them all up again. And also, like, it's kind of stupid to work, like, as much, it's also, like, no self-respect for her that she would work for these people who were just sexist, but, like, what does she think they're not going to turn on her? Like, she just doesn't seem particularly bright in this. This is what I'm saying when I said that earlier. I think that they just were looking for a franchise that they could, like, say, oh, we have a high fantasy setting. We have someone that's lesbians and it's an old franchise we can, like, reboot and count on fans watching. I feel like that's what they were going for. They weren't thinking about the actual, like, content. Why? Because Xena is well known and she's an outlaw, wanted wherever she goes with huge rewards on her head. Cornered, Xena fights mightily and slaughters every one of the thieves. I have a weird issue with the fact that she slaughters them. But finds herself surrounded by mounted warriors and held at spear point. These are the Scythians. The Scythians in our Bronze Age are fearsome horse clans, distinctive for their blazing red hair, fair skin, and gray eyes. So historically speaking... (laughs) Go ahead, say it. We want to hear it. No, okay. So the Scythians are, um, yeah, like these horseback people that came originally out of Iran. Their um, their area of control spread into into Turkey and into this into this general area. Really cool historically. Um, they came immigrated out of Iran and into Europe, like years after the Bronze Age. Are you saying that the timelines aren't matching up? I'm saying Bronze Age Turkey was the Hittite Empire. That was the major power. Like, then you have the Bronze Age collapse in maybe, like, it was, like, 12, 1100. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, And, like, a little local Dark Age. And then maybe 300 years after that or something, then you get the Scythians coming up out of Iran and into Eastern Europe. And it's after that, that they've spread out into this, you know, semi like major power, like Bronze Age Greece would never have met with the Scythians as we know them. That's not grounded. (laughs) And if you're gonna do that, I mean, it's Xena, like go for it. But 
But then like, you gotta, you gotta pick a side. You gotta one direction or the other, you know? The fact that they already went out of their way to like, address the fact that they wanted this to be more real and more gritty and you're having something that is i feel like i could forgive it if it was like 50 or 100 years away of like yeah yeah. but if it's something that that's that long that's a bit of like a yeah what the fuck now these were not contemporaneous but it's fine okay these scythians were the first people in the area to master mounted warfare i'm just gonna let that one go and are also distinctive for their heavily branded tattooed and scarified bodies these warriors carry their personal and collective history on their skin. They did have amazing that tattoos. These really like twisted animal pattern tattoos with big curling antlers, like really interesting um, artwork and tattooing that they had. No branding or scarification though, um, which is interesting to me because I feel like that's been added to make them seem extra quote unquote exotic. I thought the same thing in the first one that we did. Yeah. Here. Absolutely. Yeah. Which I will say they also did a heavy amount of in the OG Xena. Oh, for sure. Yeah. For but sure. like once again you're looking at this through That was 20 years ago. Yeah. And 1995. Eyes. Yeah. Xena knows the Scythians well, having faced and bested them when she was a warlord. Back when she had her own army and was well on her way to running a great deal of the ancient world. Now, Xena is force marched to the city of Zorana nomadic capital of this Scythian tribe. I guess the Scythians must have been in, like, the original Xena, right? Nope. So maybe that's why they weren't? Oh, okay, so they're just making it up for no reason. <laughs> oh, okay, because then I was like, oh, maybe it's an IP thing. Like, maybe be like, oh my gosh, the Scythians have arrived, and people be like, amazing, but if it's just something they made up. Zorana is a massive, magnificent tent city that moves at the king's pleasure, never becoming a fixed point or a military target. Xena has a bitter reunion with Nayar, the king of the Scythian nation, whose ass she once kicked in the field of battle, and demands a trial by combat against the best warrior in Zorana. If you had Xena the warrior princess in jail, and she was like, let's do a trial by combat, I would simply say no. There's something in like the first, I think the second season of Game of Thrones where the Starks are at war with the Lannisters and Rob Stark captures Jaime Lannister and Jaime Lannister's like, let's settle this like, like men, you and me on the battlefield and the one arm. And Rob is like, no, you'd win. Maybe they're confident. Maybe like, as how, I guess, how long has it been since she was a warlord? Maybe they're like, oh, okay, she's, she's not as fit as she was. Except that the episode starts with her kicking other people's asses. So, yeah, <laughs> I guess it doesn't tally. For her to start it, for her to request it, though, I think shows her strength, her, like, she's very confident in herself by doing this. And I think that's, I think that's the in, uh, intent with this, of to, like, for someone who has no concept of who this character is, you're just like, oh, here, we're we're showing how how confident she is in her own skills by being like, send me your your greatest warrior and I'll beat, you know, like, I think that's the idea. I think, yeah, I, I the idea of Xena doing a trial by combat is compelling to me. There were a couple times where Xena was, like, brought in for her crimes and she was, like, almost willing to, half willing to let herself get executed because she's like, I don't want to die, but I can't defend myself against anything you're accusing me of. So the fact that she's asked for a trial by combat is kind of interesting in terms of where her head is at because she's like, no, I'll kill more of you in order to survive. Xena is imprisoned pending her trial and in jail receives a very strange visitor, Nayar's daughter, the Scythian princess. The princess comes to Xena's jail cell. That's when we start hearing some of Xena's backstory because the princess knows it all. Xena's terrible past as a warrior, all the horrible things she did, how she almost ruled the world until she was betrayed by a man, Hercules, who turned her own army against her and became Athens' greatest general. Um, yeah, it seems interesting. Like, they don't have to dump it in the first episode. So I, I would much prefer little tantalizing tidbits like, thrown in like over the course of the season. It's like we they, the, both the characters know the, the the story. Like Xena is being told about her life by someone who also knows the story. So it's like, why would two characters do that? Just like in real life, like if we're both talking, like it doesn't make sense. It's also this is this is giving backstory 
in a pitch, basically. And I don't know if they mean for that to be, like, a whole episode where we go into her past, or is it, like, just a blank statement she says of, like, like, like Madam Web style of just a really bland delivery of, like... He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. If you basically, if you just hint that she's got a connection to Hercules and that's all you do in the pilot, I think that can work. But if you go too much into establishing every character's backstory in the first episode, it's just, yeah. it's too much to try to be like, what's actually important at this point, so. Yeah, so like, I'm not, I'm not a good creative writer and I took one class that I did very poorly in, in college, <laughs> but I, I do remember them like, very 101 <laughs> stuff, like, don't tell us, show us. Yeah, I don't know. Also, like, if Hercules turned her own army against her and became Athens's greatest general, like, does that mean she used to work for the Athenian government? Emily's out here like, I saw a military title and I know exactly what this military title implies and we are going to get to the bottom of this today. And that's when the princess reveals why she came. She knows Xena is the biggest badass alive. She knows Xena will win the trial by combat, and she wants Xena to kidnap her when she wins. Why? Because Gabrielle is not really the princess. She's her double and food taster. It's, like, fine. Like, I appreciate that she's not royalty. The only thing that comes to mind is that as far as she knows, like, the only thing she knows about Xena is that she's apparently a terrible fucking person. It's also weird that, like, Gabrielle is attaching herself to Xena's ship when Xena's still evil. Like, what? Yeah, like, so in the original when they met, Xena still had this really terrible reputation, but she'd actively just saved Gabrielle's life and the life of, like, her sister and a bunch of people in the village from slavers. So she, Gabrielle had personally seen with her own eyes Xena do, like, a good moral act and then, like, ask for nothing in return. I feel like this is very, like, again, it seems like they have a story that they want to tell, but it's not connected to Xena. This is, like, what I would consider a really out-of-character, uh, Xena fanfic. The princess has been missing for months, escaped when she was promised to an asshole prince from a nearby horse clan in a political alliance. Gabrielle has been forced to keep the secret on pain of death. Okay, I'm, and I'm also, I'm sorry to go here, but, like, if she's her food taster, then she would have been seen in, like, public settings or, like, parties and things like that a lot. And everyone would know that she looked exactly like the princess. And they, like, the whole, like, cat would be out of the bag about her having a double. <laughs> like, it's just not realistic. Not grounded, maybe. It's not grounded. <laughs> I'm just picturing you, like, banging a gavel. <laughs> not grounded. Would, like, would, would she sit down in, like, her chair at a public dinner and be like, hmm, nom nom nom, this is good. Oh, I dropped my fork under the table. And then, the, like, the real princess would, like, crawl up from under the table. And, like, I thought about them doing it like that. I was thinking of, like, two separate jobs that weren't compatible, but, you know? <laughs> I know that, I know that, like, doppelgangers is, like, a big theme of the early one, but I'm especially, like... You're a doppelganger of a princess and you're like, you have an official position at court where everyone can see that you look identical to the princess. Like, which monarch decided I'm going to put this obviously a bastard child right next to my legitimate <laughs> child so that everyone can say, hey, you slept around and start fighting over inheritance lines. Like, that would actually be kind of interesting, an interesting story of like, you know, the body double finds out that they're an illegitimate child of the king and um, and then they I mean, like why else make are you a... gonna look fucking identical. Like, come on. I don't know. I guess I've watched enough of the original Xena that I didn't think too much about it. All Gabrielle really wanted in life was to become a writer and a poet already hard enough for a woman in this time, but now she has to marry an asshole prince from a nearby country and in the place of her old boss, no less. That is, unless Xena can save her. Um, I, I feel like this is something that Xena would do. Rescue, like, a girl. Yeah. From a story standpoint, this is a great... Instead of just making her the princess, this is a great way to get her out of uh, commitment without you feeling like she's abandoning some sort of responsibility. Because mm. it's sort of like, as soon as you get the real princess, you're like, okay, cool. I am now free to do this other thing. Because 
if she was just the princess, the, there'd be a portion of the audience that'd be like, oh, wait, but isn't that bad for the kingdom that she's leaving behind? Ooh, so this, ooh. Gives, this gives not only like a drive, a task, but then once that task is complete, character is now free to join the seven samurai or whatever we're going for. <laughs> and during the time these two women spend talking before Xena is to fight the greatest warrior in Zorana, Xena realizes that she can save Gabrielle from becoming what she is, a woman who is given no choice. I'm literally shaking my head in real life right now. You know, women and their choices. <laughs> <laughs> Those pesky choices. Because <laughs> the thing is, about OG Xena, one of the things that just made yeah. her so unique is that she had choices and yeah. she chose violence. Do you think that they are rewriting her from a woman with agency purposely to be a woman who is given no choice? Or do you think that they mistakenly believe the original Xena from the original series was a woman with no choices? I... I think it's an attempt to satisfy an uh, what they believe to be a modern audience who who doesn't want to follow a killer basically. They don't want a protagonist that chooses violence. In doing that, I think they are shortchanging a female character. Like I don't mm. but I don't know if it's the direct intent. So you think this is potentially a gender neutral decision that was made? It's a Potentially, okay. I, I can see the meetings that would lead to that, but then, but there's probably not a woman in the meeting room. I think they knew that they were doing it, and they thought that they thought that that was the compelling narrative, and that the other one was not compelling, and people would prefer to read about women not having agency. Right, and like that, you know, that the whole point of all of this is that she's a woman. Like, the original show didn't make anywhere near this big of a deal over her gender. That just wasn't, you know? Yep. It's like just saying that that's why she, like, became a warlord. Because she didn't have a choice. She had to have been good all along and just given no choice. And, like, you know, against her will, got in with some bad kids. And in reality, like, people can choose to do bad things and then choose to do good things. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's just like reduce her to like nothing. Where's where's her choice? Where's her personality? This is also going directly against like what they previously established with in their own words mm. of Xena being like this warrior who did all these crimes. Like if that's the case, like if she was really for had her hand forced in a lot of situations, there's no fucking way that she would have conquered half of like or not half but most of the area that they're setting up in this situation that's not you don't just stumble into casually conquering a land yeah as much as i wish i could yeah um, don't we all yeah right yeah you don't accidentally become a warlord <laughs> like that doesn't accidentally happen like, you decided to do that right there are other fictional characters who've been given no choice, but like Xena's never been one of them. Interesting, like dichotomy between Buffy immediately going into it for the forces of good and Xena being like warlord. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Xena being like heads on pikes all across uh, China. Glad <laughs> ain't got shit on, on me. me. Xena has always been driven by forces outside of her, but she hasn't though. And it's fine. Her childhood was taken from her by war and she became a warrior to avenge herself. She never truly charted a destiny beyond the desire to punish those who wronged her. Just ruined my favorite character. It's fine. Anyway, it's fine. We're moving onward. They're just really doubling down hard on it. Like they didn't, it didn't just slip in. Like there are some themes that could be interpreted as her having no agency. They're taking like multiple paragraphs to very clearly articulate the fact that Xena, a woman, has no agency. Our Gabrielle is, like the original, wide-eyed, naive, and more than a little dorky, trapped in a situation she has no agency to escape, needing to go on a great journey to find herself and her own ability to chart her destiny. I'm to think of it in terms of like, I, I guess like a 45 to 50 minute episode, and then them bonding so quickly. 
about this like oh okay you don't have a like that doesn't like, organically happen over i'm assuming a conversation in a jail cell like saying oh this is the bedrock of our like relationship like oh this woman she didn't have a choice so now i'm going to like what what in that conversation would make her it's kind of fast isn't it yeah it's for a first that's your first meeting like damn <laughs> that is moving fast <laughs> I guess maybe we didn't see that there's like a month long time skip. This this character that we meet at the start of the episode who's just like beating people up for talking shit about her and then by the end of it she's kind of like become a mentor to this new person in 45 minutes. Like that is that is very fast. <laughs> we had a discussion about a great casting idea that you had for Gabrielle in a potential reboot. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the um Io Adebri oh, who's yeah, fr- from in bottom. bottoms. <laughs> no, yes, no, yes. no. You have to understand that this was a misunderstanding. Really? We were just practicing for for our self-defense club. Oh my <laughs> god, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then we were like, wait a yeah. minute. What if the woman who directed Bottoms was showrunner for the Xena reboot? You can't do this to me. Like, that's not like this is. <laughs> this is a movie that I've reviewed five times on Letterboxd. Xena's trial by combat finally arrives, but it never takes place because just before it can take place, the city's war horns blare. They are under attack. I just want to say, like, I would be so irritated already. Because they've been talking about this trial by combat thing for maybe 15 <gasps> minutes of the runtime. And then it doesn't even happen? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> like, that is the biggest tease ever. In an epic action sequence that serves as the centerpiece of the pilot, a small army led by Hercules and flying the Athenian flag in the middle of Bronze Age Scythian Anatolia. It's fine. I can hear how fine it is in your voice. Breathe, make it slow. Sacks the city of Zorana and kills Scythians in the thousands. Um, I thought they were like a big nomad tent city so they could pick up and run without becoming a military target. I guess all their scouts were asleep. Yeah, that happens. The raid's target is Nayar, whom Eurus has come to see as a dangerous potential rival. This is the bigger overarching story that Eurus is a despot and has been waging surprise attacks on his rivals, hoping to take out anyone who will challenge him. Realizing that her hated nemesis is here, Xena fights all the way to Nayar's compound, just in time to see his defeat by Hercules and the kidnapping of Gabrielle. Eurus not only sent Hercules to humiliate Nayar, but also to abduct the princess and take her back to Athens as a wife. I remember we talked about this in our discussion of the pilot. Like, it's just like, hey, have you considered that sometimes women are threatened with sexual violence? Like, yes, I've considered that every day of my life. I don't want to see it in Xena. <laughs> and also what the original Xena did is they just they were always giving women agency, even when historically we don't know if they would have had it. Like yeah. Helen of Troy chose to marry Paris, whatever his name was, like yeah. in, in the Xena version. Thus giving him reign over the Scythians. Thus giving reign over the Scythians. But isn't the king still around? Yes. The people they just killed in the thousands. Yeah. But like, okay, so when they say when they say things like, oh, it's a political marriage, is because they like they want to bring the people together. But you just said yeah. they killed them in the thousands. So, like, why would she be a bargaining tool? Like, you already, like, defeated them badly. Like, why would you take her on as a wife? I they I, Maybe they're like, oh, we want to take her as a prize or, like, I don't know, to discourage other people from, like, attacking us or something. But not, I don't know. Question mark? Like, what? what's the, I don't understand the, like, the logic here. Well, he's also, like, he's not even, like, defeated them, camped his army there, and been like, okay, we're now signing a treaty and a marriage contract. He showed up, slaughtered a bunch of people, grabbed Gabrielle, and left? It's like, um, Jasmine in Aladdin. Like, <laughs> Jafar... It is! <laughs> Jafar wants to marry her to get to be the sultan. 
This is where I learned history from. <laughs> I also watched the TV show for Aladdin, so... <laughs> yeah, but that's when you, like, marry into the kingdom and then take yeah. over once the king is dead. That's not kidnapping the princess. And, of course, seeing Hercules again galvanizes Xena, the man who betrayed her, taking away the woman she sees as her hope for redemption. Since when? Where? They didn't introduce that at all. Xena bonds fast, eh? (laughs) 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 Hope for redemption in a day, even. Like, what is that conversation? Like, I guess the, the actors who do this scene would have to be friggin' incredible. To relay all of that. So unless Gabrielle is just like in that cell constantly just going down on Xena. Yeah. Just, and also the original Xena didn't see Gabrielle as her path to redemption. I nope. think she was attracted to the fact that Gabrielle saw her as a good person. Yeah. But like her path to redemption was doing good and protecting people. She's a mercenary. She could rescue someone anytime she wants. But Gabrielle is the first one that she's found pretty. <laughs> just give her a typical man's motivation. <laughs> it is just bottoms. I want in that <laughs> pussy, so I'm gonna pretend that I've got feminist motivations. Oh my god, dude! Totally have the main uh, football guy be mm. Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> she now has a quest to save Gabrielle and motivation to get revenge on Hercules. And once again, yeah. it's a pilot. Yeah, yeah, I understand yeah. that this is like, they want the vision out there. And then yeah. once you actually get the directors and the yeah. actual writers to come in, they'll yeah. be able to like, have a good story yeah. go through. So if this was to be greenlit, I'm sure people would catch that and be like, "Sure, no, 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 no. As the pilot ends, Xena confronts the wounded Nayar in the smoking ruins of his capital. Nayar plans on rounding up his armies and marching on Athens to retrieve his daughter and lost honor. What, does he know that she's a double? She is! It's his daughter! He's, he might not know. <laughs> Supposedly the reason he wants her is that so he can make a marriage alliance with that other tribe or whatever, right? To say this as like, delicately as possible, I don't know how much that marriage alliance would still be considered viable by the people of this age. So, like, what is he trying to get her back for? That's not even his daughter. Xena smirks. What Nayar proposes is suicide. He doesn't have the forces to defeat Eurus and Hercules in Athens. This campaign will be the end of the Nayar's people. Nayar, however, feels he has no choice. Honor must be redeemed in the field of war. Gross. <laughs> Disagree. <laughs> okay, this guy is a bad king. Like, he's like, <laughs> like not as in like a bad person. Like I mean, like he's not good at his job. <laughs> like, <laughs> if it's if it's lost honor code for like gold or something, because damn, like, why is he doing this? Zena makes a counter proposal. She will go to Athens, infiltrate the court of Eurus, and rescue Gabrielle in exchange for her freedom and the protection of the Scythian tribes, essentially lifting her fugitive status. Does she not have any bounties from anyone besides the Scythians? Is that what that's implying? It does say she wants their protection, though. Yeah, but like, if then if she goes wandering around Greece, like, they can't do anything about that. Like, they have no legal reach there. Now, it's Nayar's turn to call Xena suicidal. She is a wanted criminal. Maybe, Xena replies, but at least she is not covered in tattoos, branding, and scarifications, and easily recognizable as a Scythian agent. I have a few questions. Okay. (laughs) First of all, does he not know that his daughter is missing? No, like- Is he not aware of the swap? Was he not the one who ordered that? What's happening here? Why is he sending her after someone who's not his kid, quotation marks? I think the idea is, like, you can't come into my house and take one of my kids and not get stomped for it. Right, right, right. It doesn't matter if you care about the kid. Right. It's, like, on the principle of it. Right. Which is why they're saying it's about the honor, not about his love for anyone. If she is his only heir, 
he can just have another baby. Like he can just he can just marry again or whatever and have another baby. And I'm sure he already does, to be honest. Like he doesn't seem like a good guy. So he probably has like 12 kids out there. Like he could just like pick another one. Like, okay, yeah, now my new heir. Just choose one of them. Gendry's out there. We can find yeah. Gendry. <laughs> Nayar agrees to send Xena on the mission, with one condition. She only has as long as it takes for Nayar to gather reinforcements and heal from his wounds, to retrieve Gabrielle. If Xena is not back by then, the Scythians will march on Athens. This is just pedantic, but they would all be on horseback, so they wouldn't be marching anywhere. And if that means the destruction of Nayar's people, at least honor will be satisfied. Why would she give a fuck what happens to his people? Like, what's this ultimatum? Like, we're all gonna kill ourselves if you're not back in time. Like, what? Like I said, he's bad at his job. Like, his, like his <laughs> method of negotiation is like, you know, if you don't come back in time, I'm literally going to cut my own face. So do what I say, like the angry toddler solution. They needed a motivation. <laughs> They're just like, what? Why is she doing this? Like, it can't just be Gabrielle's winning smile. So, the the further we get into it, it just reeks of the like first draft of a script. They're like, we need a motivation. Someone say, okay, yep, yeah, write it down. Don't worry, no but no wrong answers. Okay, we need a timer. We need a ticking clock. What's why does she have to do this now? Sure, okay, fine, right? Like, we'll we'll fix it later for a better version. And then they never did. <laughs> I'm still not sure, like, what they mean by honor. Like, he's saying, like, I need to go and fight these people because they beat me. And I know that they're going to beat me again. And in so doing, that's going to restore my honor because they're going to beat me. Like, like he knows he's going to. He says, I have no choice. I know they're going to beat me. So you're going to lose your honor twice, right? Is that what the honor? Like, honor is, like, meaning, like, you don't lose. I don't know. The pilot episode ends as Xena, still a ruthless fighter, still a mercenary, but her heart a little bit softer from her knowledge of Gabrielle. What did Gabrielle do? Oh, cut shirt, probably. Gathers her armor and weapons, her sword and chakram, and rides off to rescue Gabrielle, and, in doing so, avenge herself on Eurus and Hercules. I find, like, the this pitch with all its problems is promises something better than what we got. Mm. Still promises something better than what we got. Like, if it had stuck closer to whatever this is, it wouldn't have been, like, you know, so god-awful that. I agree in terms of, like, I do think that there are, like, fewer horrendous things in this, but I feel like the structural issues that make it, like, not fun as a work for Xena are all yeah. still present. Yeah, it's yeah. not as like deeply upsetting, I guess. She's not starting out on Hercule- yeah. under Hercules' thumb. There's not a hundred rape threats on every page. She doesn't yeah. start out getting beaten really badly. And so you could fix a lot of these things that you and I, mm. in like an hour-long discussion, are already finding issues with. <laughs> like... Yeah, yeah. So you get, you also, you find the series Bible that they would have made for the original show. We can tweak a bit, but that should still be the basis of these characters. Mm. So, in theory, this could have moved forward. It's very, yeah, no, it's very mixed bag of, one, there was a lot of, like, inconsistencies that we saw that we kind of also addressed. Mm. There were a couple things that I did like, mm. or at least I could see where the vision is, yeah. right? And once again, once we have writers, mm. more like an actual room full of writers yeah. to like be able to be like... Make it make sense. Yes. Uh, to like go through all of that and like actually hash out all the finer points. I think that it could be done. I think so far this is not been presented in a way that is good, though. It feels very... To put myself on blast, mm. I wrote a script <laughs> when I was in sixth grade of where we were going to go with the story now that Xena was dead. Yep. Very those vibes. These are making a lot of parallels, and yeah. I'm like, oh. 
But you're right, this is a basis upon which things could have been built. Act 1, Escape from Athens. In the first act of the series, after the pilot episode, Xena makes her way to Athens, making contact with members of the army she lost to Hercules, many of whom are starting to see that they backed the wrong horse, and forcing them to atone for their betrayal by helping her to enter the city and infiltrate the palace of Eurus. I was about to say, that's also very Xena. Yeah. Absolutely, a ragtag team of people she knew way back when, helping to do like a heist thing. Oh That's, yeah, yeah. Yes. Z- I, I will, I will go on record as yeah. saying Xena did a lot of Ocean's Eleven. Yes, a lot of Ocean's Eight. Yes, we we saw a lot of Xena being like, "You son of a bitch, I'm in camp, camp." And so, like, I kind of like where that's going. Yeah. I also like the idea of it. Also, is the idea of. Xena meets a lot of people from her past mm. that she also inspires redemption. Mm. Right? And this is kind of we're seeing them of them being like, yeah, I backed the wrong course, but also I kind of just don't want to be in this situation. Yeah, yeah and I love an infiltration thing. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Heist Gotta vibes. Stealthy. Yeah, heist. Exactly. Some of them are thinking of defecting to Ares. Oh, I'm sure he's another warlord or something because it's grounded in reality or whatever. He's like some drug dealer. Okay. Wouldn't you make him be the most powerful, scary person in the area? Well, and you make him the very psychologically manipulative person that is like, he have followers that believe him to actually be the god of war, right? Like that can mm. work. Really mm. cool concept. Xena makes contact with Gabrielle, who is being groomed to marry Eurus and drugged into a suggestible state in which she may even come to believe that she loves the city's evil monarch. Why? <laughs> if I could, like, send vomit emoji, like, verbally, I would be sending right now. I really liked in Xena how it wasn't, like, triggering all the, like, lack of agency about your gender traumas anyone's ever had every time you're watching it and it's just very upsetting what drugs as well like what bronze age what are they giving her ayahuasca that's they're giving in bronze age greece they're giving her ayahuasca (laughs) xena and gabrielle's bond is still there but gabrielle will eventually become completely physically and psychologically dependent on uris the clock is ticking I think because they want to get to a conflict with her and Xena at some point where Xena actually comes to rescue her and she no longer wants to be rescued. I think they want that beat to be at the end of an episode and then you're like, wait, what happened? And then it's a new conflict of somehow Xena has to get her off whatever these drugs are or wait the amount of time for them to wear off. So this is another thing, just like what you said before. They need a ticking clock. Yeah. Okay, is this um, this princess person she's impersonating, like, is she some, like, super desirable or, like, politically desirable or physically desirable? Because I don't get why everyone is so, like... I thought this was supposed to be more real. Like, what magic pills are they giving her to make her fall in love with him? Like, is Aphrodite behind it? Because she's not supposed to be a god. <laughs> is it grounded? <laughs> this is not grounded, Emily. This is not grounded. It's not giving us anything about Gabrielle's characterization or Xena's characterization or like even the villain's characterization. Like it's just like, oh, and now she can't make any decisions because da da da. But her bond quotation marks with Xena is still there. What bond? And they're just reminding us again, make sure you understand that Gabrielle has no agency. We're going to drug her so you really understand. And we haven't even been properly introduced to this character, so we don't know anything about her. She's just been like, you know, had one conversation, one 30-minute conversation where we learned everything, and then she's just drugged now? Like, when do we actually get to meet Gabrielle? You know, this reminds me a lot of, like, it reminds me about, like, the Avengers. So I didn't know who Hawkeye was, right? Like, he just had, like, Mm. a couple of scenes in the previous uh, Thor movie so now like his first introduction to the um to the Avengers is like him being mind fucked by Loki essentially so like we don't get to know him like we get to see like the zombie version of um Clint but this is what they're doing to Gabrielle like so this whole season she isn't really Gabrielle she's like drug adult 
Gabrielle. Or maybe she has like some spots of like sanity. I don't know. I don't know how compelling it is to watch because like this is this isn't really her. We have her in the first episode giving like the most epic, convincing, I am the best person in the world. You should save me. And Zena's like, yes, girl, I'm going to sacrifice everything for you because of this conversation. And then the next time we see her is in this drug adult state for what maybe is like four or five episodes. So we don't really get to know Gabrielle, which is a shame. Unable to simply rescue Gabrielle and spirit her out of the royal palace, Xena instead engineers a massive revolt from inside Eurus's harem, which she uses as cover to kidnap Gabrielle. That's a Zena, very Xena thing. She would engineer a revolt in a harem. Well, she did. It, one thing a girl's gonna do is engineer a revolt in a harem. Girl boss. So, so far we've gotten the gaslighting of Gabrielle. We've yeah. gotten the girl bossing of the harem. Now when are we gonna gatekeep? The idea of having to, to kidnap her rather than rescue her. I think that could be done in a campy way that would be fun, honestly. Right. In the final episode of the first act, Xena escapes from Eurus' palace with Gabrielle and has a major boss battle with her former lover, Hercules, whom she cannot kill but ultimately maims horribly, most likely dismembering him, and renders him unable to ever fight again. What the fuck? <laughs> That's very different. <laughs> um. Okay, this version of Hercules? Yes, please. Nobody ask any more questions. He's not coming back. We wrote him off. They need a short hand for that. But she can't kill him? Yeah, like she couldn't She couldn't bring herself to kill him, obviously, because if she maimed him horribly, then she could have killed him. Yeah. Unless he, like, stumbled away. <laughs> <laughs> she, like, chopped two limbs off, and then he sort of, like, fell down a manhole cover. But this is also good to know that this was how it was originally, and then it went to the studio or wherever, and then they said, no, actually, we need hercules to beat the crap out of her yeah because she couldn't beat him in a fight in the other pilot episode it seemed like but here like she's defeated him quite handily but that that feels like that classic trope right of like oh but i've loved you in the past so i can't kill you but i can dismember you i will cut your dick off <laughs> what i would have thought like this big boss thing would be like towards the end once she's grown and whatever, like grown as a character, like once we get to know her, it, it seems kind of unearned. How many episodes would the, like a first act be? Like, are they saying like maybe three episodes to get here? I guess, right? Yeah. The vibe I get is that they want Hercules to be a recurring character, though. Like, I don't, I think that's the bigger, that's the writer's reason for not having her kill him. One, it feels like you just killed off a boss like that so like you could have had hercules been a boss for a fucking while yeah for a hot minute like caesar was around for a full three four seasons literally like, and... and Ares has also been one of those villain one of those people like yeah. villains turned allies yeah where like you felt his presence throughout this series until he became an ally mm. so i kind of don't understand it act two the road to zorana and revenge of callisto in the second section of the story, Xena races back across the Aegean Sea and the Anatolian Peninsula to return Gabrielle to Nayar, but the journey is fraught as Gabrielle struggles to recover from the psychological wounds of her captivity. Once again, this has been like three days, right? Yeah, I look, they're not giving me a time scale. Maybe it's been six months. If she's only been there a short time, it's certainly enough time to give her trauma of all kinds. I don't understand the brainwashing they're implying. Yeah. I don't understand, like, the mechanism of that. I don't get it. Ayahuasca. <laughs> Ayahuasca. <laughs> Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca bondage. That's Loki a really good drag name. Is that, like, what you picture when you picture Gabrielle from Xena? You're like, she should have more PTSD. Like, that would be a fun romp. Yeah, how can we just, like, completely destroy the joyfulness and youth and innocence of her character? Let's just make her endure sexual assault in the first episode and then have PTSD the entire time. Because, like, Zena wasn't a escape from that for, you know, let's just, let's just bring it right there. Okay, for the sake of all possible clarity, this is how I want to lay it out, right? OG Zena had, um, had a couple scenes of, like, Oh, Xena being roughly handled by a man. 
a man she was also routinely horrible to and who was, you know, frustrated with her because she was being too bloodthirsty. Um, those scenes took place like 10 years in the past when she was still very young and weren't like, it took a couple of seasons for us to even see that happening on screen. Gabrielle had this whole sort of metaphorical assault by a demon storyline, whatever. It was metaphorical, and it also took a few seasons to even be shown on screen. This was not how she was introduced to us. There was a harem-themed episode that centered on all this sort of sexualized violence. That didn't happen until season six, and it also stuck out like a sore thumb because it was so unusual in the series. How you How you decide to introduce a character and open a show, it matters in terms of the overall impression of the show and the characters that you want to give. And that's, that's really what's coming through is so wildly different to me. And as Yuris finds a new soldier to take on the duty of hunting down Xena, Callisto. Callisto ain't gonna work for anyone else. Like, I just think she'd be like, hmm, maybe I'll just torture you for dinner tonight. You know, like, yes. I just don't think she would care. <laughs> this is, again, taking these two women who were top of their game, top of the food chain, and making them work for someone else. And for what? Like, what does it add to the plot? What also happens with reboots and stuff is because you, you're never guaranteed more than one season if you even get the one season... There's the the knee jerk reaction to introduce as much as possible, like right away, and then if your series actually lasts more than like two seasons, you're like, oh, we've done all the stuff already. Now what do we do? That's fair though. I think I understand why they would want to pull in fan favorites and potentially really like powerful, like character backstories and character conflict. Callisto is a sociopathic warlord who styled herself on Xena after Xena, during her pirate warrior phase, destroyed her village and murdered her family. Callisto is the epitome of a split image, and in some ways is Xena's dark daughter, equal parts fan and arch enemy. Kind of like the Joker to Xena's Batman, if it started with like Batman accidentally killing the Joker's entire family. <laughs> oh, that sounds way more interesting than what we've just done. Like the whole like Hercules yeah. confusing king situation. Like I yeah. would much like they should have just started here. Actually, in the closest thing to magic we will see during the first season, Xena must take the increasingly volatile Gabrielle to a Phrygian mountaintop monastery to undergo a form of treatment not unlike ibogaine dosing for heroin addicts for her drug-induced bondage to Eurus. What the fuck? Like, why? Who asked for this? What does this add? I don't, like, I don't... I hate this so much. <laughs> oh, 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 no, that, that's what we needed that was missing. She's on PTSD, and she's going through withdrawal and needs, like, addiction counseling. Because we really haven't destroyed the innocence of Gabrielle in the first 30 minutes, like, thoroughly enough. And also, like, I thought they were supposed to, like, rush her back so that the, the horse people didn't die, but now they were like, I guess, forget that. It doesn't feel like it falls within the world's mechanisms. Like, if you're going to establish a magic system, like, have that magic system make sense, right? Mm. We have evil ayahuasca, <laughs> and we have good ayahuasca. <laughs> Inside you, there are two ayahuascas. Taking the potion, Gabrielle hallucinates horribly and tries to murder Xena, and ultimately emerges not only as herself, but stronger. An abuse survivor, now more hell-bent on being a force for good in the world. Oh my god, if only we knew that, like, going through abuse was the only way to become a strong woman. Yeah, it's, it's really... It's really annoying, and I can see why they do it, right? Because, like, like if it's not Gabrielle, but, like, Gabriel, why is it always, like, women... They, their trials and tribulations have to in involve, like, abuse. Yeah, but with women, it's always the go-to. Like, okay, how do we show that this woman is strong? Like, she's not physically strong, but she's emotionally strong because she went through, like, 
just the worst things that a woman could go through. And that's her, that's her strength is, you know, being a survivor of assault. Like, could we do something else? They should have, like, in the original show, was she, like, comic relief as well? Like, a, a, yes. kind of, yeah. Okay, yeah. then they should have just done that. Like, because so far, she's a real downer. Like, it's really <laughs> depressing. They said, like, oh, the words you're not going to hear us use is depressing. Like, this is depressing. In the aftermath of this, and in one of the emotional climaxes of the series, Xena and Gabrielle consummate their love for one another and realize that their shared struggles have bonded them together. This is actually, like, kind of nasty to me. Like, the only... Like, Xena has literally had one conversation with her when she wasn't brainwashed by a love potion. And she's like, I just ha- took you to, like, addiction counseling and now I'm gonna fuck you? Like, bro, that's a problem. Yeah, she's got serious PTSD and sexual trauma and she's going with through withdrawal. I don't know that Gabrielle's capable of consent right now. Like, this is... Ugh. They fuck him. I'm not opposed to, like, them starting off that Xena and Gabrielle have a mutual attraction to each other. Yeah, like, sure, go for it. Like, yeah, start from episode one of them being mutually attracted to each other. Mm. It just doesn't seem like they've been mutually attracted to each other. It seems yeah. like Xena saw a young, for lack of a better word, a PYT, mm. <laughs> um, who she kind of saw a little bit of herself in, mm-hmm. once again, going by their rules, not yeah. really... By, VOG, yeah. yeah. So, like, takes that, takes her from this ayahuasca den to another (laughs) ayahuasca den up in the mountains. Right! Xena's just seen a drugged out, psychologically tormented, emotionally and physically abused Gabrielle, and is like, I'm gonna hit that. I'm gonna hit that. And it just doesn't make sense. I can understand, once again, if it had been, like, maybe maybe Xena had been locked up for, like, a week or something yeah. like that. And Gabrielle had come down every day. Yeah. And there had been a slow-burning romance yeah. that started there. Oh, yeah. That would make sense. It's just there's been no romance set up for yeah. them from the start. They are basing this entirely on people's previous knowledge of Xena and Gabrielle being a canonical thing in the end. To, like, kind of jump through loopholes of just having them immediately be an item mm. together. And this is act two as well. Couldn't, okay, they are, they are speed, speed running through everything. They could have left this to the end. Also, like, and I know this doesn't matter, but I fucking hate this typo. But no sooner have Xena and Gabrielle emerged from this ordeal than Callisto catches up with them and in their ensuing conflict realizes that if Xena and Gabrielle do not return to Zorana, the entire Scythian kingdom will be left open to invasion as Nayar takes every able-bodied warrior on his mission to Athens. Callisto soon realizes that if she kills Xena and Gabrielle, she can not only get her revenge, she could also potentially set herself up as new queen of Scythia while Eurus destroys Nayar and his armies. This is Eddie Izzard just like planting the flag, just be like, you have a flag? <laughs> And then Kalisto. She didn't seem to have like particular aspirations towards anything except for making Xena suffer. I mean, like Kalisto is our PTSD character, you know, and she didn't. She's just living in her trauma, and all she's seeing is her family burning to death every single day. And all she wants to do is make Xena hurt the way she hurt. I don't think that she had like political aspirations beyond that. I think the armies, everything that she built up was just about getting satisfaction and hoping if she could make the person who hurt her hurt the way that she hurt, that somehow it would relieve her pain. And, and her entire motivation is that it's not yeah. for power for power's sake. Totally agree. Obviously, the reboot doesn't need to one for one match like every aspect of every character to the original. Like, it's even good if they do their own new interpretations of stuff, as long as those are good interpretations. But, like, Callisto, as you describe her, Callisto of the OG, is a much more unique character than just like yet another person who wants to be like the ruler of some plot of land. Yeah, you can change Callisto, but like her role in the original series is a really key part of what makes the story complete and compelling because she is Xena's reminder of who she was when she was evil. You know, mm. she 
is the living manifestation of the monstrosities that Xena committed. She was just a little girl. And, you know, that's like the one time that Xena's army killed women and children, killing her family. And it's like Xena confronting her dark past. And so like Callisto's character and role is like the vessel, one of the vessels through which Xena confronts her dark past. And that's like, she won't kill Callisto when she's willing to kill so many other people for so much less. But she won't kill Callisto, and Callisto is so, so dangerous. And I think that that dynamic is important. Like, yeah, I agree, you can change things, but you're just kind of ripping the heart out of the series and what what mattered about it. She's almost like a dog chasing a car, where if she killed Xena, she wouldn't know what to do with herself. Well, she would, I mean, if she had succeeded. like, So yeah. in an alternate universe where Callisto yeah. succeeds and kills Xena. Yeah. And then she realizes that she still feels just as empty and just as in pain. And that this hasn't fixed anything. Like, yep. I don't know where she goes from there. Like yeah. that, that would be a really interesting story. I'd honestly rather watch that. <laughs> like as much as I don't want to see Zena die. Like I'd rather see that. <laughs> if you don't get time or a bunch of really painful conversations between the two of them, What's the point of Callisto? Why is she interesting? Are they Why is she the foil to Xena? Yeah. Why does Xena care so much about trying to redeem Callisto? Yeah. Um that could be almost like a cold open for the series where you you see this village being attacked, you see this little girl get totally traumatized, you see her like go to pick up a weapon towards the end and in- you don't realize until the end of the series that you weren't watching Xena's backstory, you were watching Callisto's. Callistos yeah. yeah. As the second act draws to a close, Xena and Gabrielle bravely escape from Callisto, but fail to return to Zorana in time. Nayar's armies march on Athens. Eurus's forces meet them and destroy them summarily. Callisto is now poised to take Zorana and become the new Scythian queen, and only Xena and Gabrielle know her plans. How do they know her plans? I guess she, like... Like, when they met on the mountaintop, I guess she, like, she had, like, a villain speech where she was, like... The villain speech will always be the fucking downfall of bitches. <laughs> yeah. Why is everyone so interested in Scythia <laughs> as, as, as a place? It's not even a place. Like you said, it's moving tents. It's moving tents of people who don't fight very well. Like, what do they have? I mean, really? <laughs> This would be a point where they should actually like give us bullet points. Like, okay, Scythia, these are the benefits of being the queen of Scythia because I don't see it. We have like two horses, maybe five tents and like 500 people to feed. And that's the kingdom that you want. <laughs> this is giving me big, like the same shit I was saying earlier. They were like, okay, we know what we're going to do. We're going to take this franchise. We're going to use the big villains from the last season. And we're going to make everyone get really excited because here's the big villains. But they're not like thinking about the characterization. She she does again. Callisto maybe should be the one getting a show here. I I have said that for years. Yeah, she's not be gay do crime. She's just do crime. Yeah, she's just do crimes. Inside you, there are two wolves. <laughs> do and crime. Act three, the warrior queen, reaching Zorana before Callisto and bringing the news of her impending invasion. The first thing they ever told us about this city is that it is a city of tents and these are horseback people who can pick up and move so they never become a fixed military target. Just leave! Xena and Gabrielle face a new problem. The warriors left behind by Nayar refuse to accept Gabrielle's legitimacy. Which makes sense because she's not the princess. (laughs) not the princess, yeah. I wonder why. (laughs) The Scythians will not only not follow her orders, many believe this entire mess to be her fault. Like, okay, I'm not. Why? They said G- Gabrielle is a fake princess, right? Or is she not yeah. believing that she is a real one? Like, did they brain addled her to think that she's a princess for real? I, I don't think so. Yeah. So because- when they're like, "Oh, the the generals don't believe her legitimacy because she's not. She's a fake princess. She has no business being there." Facing a fractious population that can't come together to defend their lands. Gabrielle must face the general left behind by her father in combat and prove herself a warrior. Why? Okay, wait, hold on. Okay. I'm you know that that like gif of like the woman and there's like the math. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, why are they pitted against the general? Like, they're supposed to be on the same side. Because the general is a man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, and they're women. I almost forgot. I almost were thinking of, I almost thought about them as just people. And Right. Uh, yeah, okay. But you see, that wouldn't be a good story if there were just people with motivations. It has to be women with women motivations. But she went to rescue Gabrielle for the establishment yes. in Scythia. Yes. Like, she was working for, yes. like, the general's people. Yes. And then she succeeded. She did what she said she'd do, and she brought Gabrielle back. Yeah. Like she said she would do. Yeah. Okay. It's not grounded. <laughs> Banging the gavel. <laughs> not grounded. <laughs> Tell the general that an army's coming to attack and let him do his job. Yeah. Why do you need to lead anybody anywhere? And didn't she say she wanted to be a poet and what else? And um, a yeah, a bard. yeah, so what that is, I, she's not qualified. <laughs> like it's, and it's okay. <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> Unless they're trying to say, like, throughout the season, she gains this, like, desire to lead people, <laughs> which would be a bizarre change. Like, presumably the general knows, how, like, what to do in a war. You'd hope. <laughs> I see the skepticism. <laughs> We're not even going there. <laughs> but, like, he'd know better than her, wouldn't he? That's sexist. You don't know. <laughs> I don't, yeah, you're right. Just because he's a man with decades of military experience. <laughs> but even after Gabrielle unites her people... There's a lot of details missing here. <laughs> they just skipped over that. They were like single combat. Then they were like, anyways, so yeah. moving on. So, so did she win? Did she not? I, you know... I guess she won because she's uniting them. Y you know... But, you know, again, like, this is a pitch for a full season. I don't blame the guy for wanting to keep it a little vague. Right. This is this is what you write. It's like, you got a 1 p.m. deadline. You're at the library. Don't I know that too well? Oh, yeah. The sad truth is that the force left behind is no match for Callisto's army. Xena only knows one way to save Gabrielle's land and people. She must return to a former lover of hers, the warlord Ares. No. <laughs> No, she doesn't. And she's going to have to, like, use her sexuality to get Ares to help. Right? I mean, what other... I hate all of this. <laughs> I just, I hate it. I hate everything. Wow. I'm, like, I'm actually kind of shocked that they actually decided whether he was the dad or the lover in this one. I'm like, well, you guys made a choice. I just, it's, it's going back to the, like, no options, no agency. Xena only knows one way the only way Zena knows how to get something done is to go use sex to get a former lover to help. Like, is that really? Like, she really doesn't have any other options here? Like, Zena in the original fought the entire Battle of Thermopylae by herself. Like, what do you mean she's got no options? And she's also smart. She, like, does weird shit. She and they even show that like she made an uprising like you can why doesn't she infiltrate their army and take Kalisto out in the dead of night why doesn't she do anything other than going to fuck Ares ooh, 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 ooh. what happened to all those old soldiers of hers back in Athens who helped her out because they regret following Hercules instead of yeah, her yeah go recruit them Ares is a powerful military leader who has encamped an army in what is now modern day Istanbul but Ares' allegiance draws a steep price. In exchange for sending his armies to Zorana, Ares demands that Xena betroth herself to him. Boo! Ugh. <laughs> yep. Bruh, shut up! I'm literally holding my laptop, like, pacing circles in my living room. <laughs> Can you add some, like, like really loud crowd booing in post to really get, like, get yes, across please. how loudly I want to scream into this mic right now? But, um, what's his face saying? Disappointed in it. Disappointed! There's just, like, so many other ways that I feel like could have gone about, especially the fact that these people are supposedly a nomadic yeah. warrior race. 
And specifically, if we know that it's coming from Callisto, yeah, and we know what she has up her sleeve, it doesn't feel too far fetched for them to be the like underdogs and come out on top. You make a really good point that I hadn't thought of as well is that like if this was if this was the campy OG show, what would happen is that she rallies the women who have been left behind in camp right. to defend their home, right? And somehow they win magically. And you realize this is both of them now. Zena and Gabrielle in season one, both in forced marriages and implied situations of sexual subjugation. What, there's just so many things that you could have done besides the weird misogynistic undertones of Zena still at the end of the day needs a man to save her. Yeah. Why is any of that anything? Like, that's just bizarre. Xena offering herself in marriage to some guy because she can't win a battle on her own? That's like the antithesis of everything that ever happened yeah. ever in the entire original series. This must have come up in, in interim discussions because what happens in the, in the official pilot script when Gabrielle agrees to go off and become the fake princess, Zena's like, I would never do that. What we could do, we can solve this. We can, is it okay? Okay. Okay. Gabrielle herself is a double of a princess. Mm-hmm. We find a, a double for Zena to marry <laughs> this guy. <laughs> uh, so many weddings. Okay. <laughs> a, a male character would not have three, <laughs> three marriage plots. <laughs> In a single season. <laughs> I'll have to have a new army. Whatever you want, whomever you want. The most legendary fighters in history, if you'd like. Why is this framed, even if the same actions happen, why is this being framed as him forcing her to do something rather than her being smart and deciding to manipulate him to get what she wants? Because then women would have agency. <laughs> and also, like, just going back to like how different this is from the actual series is like, yeah, he Ares would try to blackmail her, be my co-warlord. And then and yeah. also maybe we can fuck, you know? And it's like yeah. that was fine. Like, you know, him being like, no, but then you need to like you need to conquer the world with me. And of course, like we're gonna bang because that would be fun. But like he's yeah. not like, you need to marry me and be my wifey. He's like, I respect you and your bloodlust and your ability to conquer people. And I want you to help me conquer the world. And you have to help me do that. Like, yes. it's just such a different tone. Not just my warrior. You'll be the architect of a new world. Where force of arms keeps the peace and one great warrior queen rules. And like, why is sex such a big deal? Like in the original series, like people are having <laughs> sex all the time. Yeah. And like Zena like might consider banging Aries, like why not? But it's like they're putting it as this big thing to control people and you know and to to take away people's agency and to hurt people instead of it just being like a side thing that's not traumatic. In the the pilot script, there was this scene where like Hercules, you know, she does the job for him, he takes the credit, he threatens her threatens to slap her, but then they make a specific point of being like, then they go have sex in the tent and she's on top. It's such a simplistic view of power dynamics in relationships and in sex. She should either be laying back while he goes down on her for an hour, or she could be pegging him in the ass, like if she doesn't mind standing up and getting like, you know, a little sweaty. I might come back at any moment. Maybe we should continue. <laughs> There's a lot of other positions, guys. Reverse cowgirl while she's reading a book, you know? I am nodding along. This makes perfect sense to me. And if you want to have Ares be a character that badly, like, you could have Ares be the, like... You could have Ares be, like, the hidden bad. He's got to be, like, the Moriarty to her Sherlock Holmes. Right. He's not the villain of the week. He's in the background pulling some strings. Right. Everywhere you go, you're going to... And you could do it so subtly, too. He's profiteering off of everything war-related, yeah. which would also fit in line with you being the war god. Yeah. You love seeing war because you see your profits go up. In a tough and bitter decision, Xena decides that it is better to save Gabrielle's people 
than to have the woman she loves. <sighs> Can we talk about the language, though? Have the woman she loves rather than be with the woman she loves? <laughs> Gabrielle implores Zena, wanting to escape instead. But Zena tells her that it is her duty, having destroyed so many lives, to give up her own to save many. Gabrielle doesn't know how to be, like, a brave and moral person without Zena to tell her how. That's backwards. Like, her whole thing was she wanted to run away. And then she was like, yeah. no, I want to play general now. It's like, no, cool, actually, let's run away again. I would be so <laughs> mad at her. Like, pick a lane. Are you a bard? Are you a ministry leader? Are you someone who's just cool with marriages now? I don't get it. Similarly, Gabrielle ultimately realizes that her own desire to forge her own destiny has to coexist with her own responsibility to the safety of her people. One, that's a real quick turnaround. Two, why did Zena have to teach this to her instead of her realizing it herself? Three, it's not actually her responsibility. Yeah, and she's giving Zena up the way, like, you know, people give up carbs. Gabrielle agrees to give Zena up. And in the final battle, Zena leads Ares' armies against Callisto and wins the day as Nea returns from his own failed campaign to witness Gabrielle's apotheosis as a warrior queen. But, like, it was Zena who won? Yeah, I don't know. What? Like, the warrior queen was, isn't Callisto? Like, I saw that title and I was like, oh, they're referencing that she said she was going to be the warrior queen. And they're making... Nope. What? No. Nope. When did she learn how to fight, by the way? Like, is it sprinkled in there, or...? <laughs> she fucking didn't! I don't know. Well, I wish they had turned, like, Gabrielle into some sort of... Like, I wish the whole, like, being a poet and bard, like, came into it in some way. Like, the fact, like, maybe she sees the world differently, and, like, she's able to think of solutions that Xena can't, or something. Yeah, like, if she'd managed to convince people through a really moving speech. Of course, there is one twist left. Xena fakes her own death in the battle and offers Gabrielle the chance to go with her. I'm also very curious as to how one even does that. Like, how do you fake your own death in the battle? Like, this with swords and shields and stuff. Like, does she have, like, a can of, uh, I don't know, like, old ketchup that she's going to splatter on her like, <laughs> chest? Or, <laughs> like, what is this plan? <laughs> So like how like in the old movies, like when you're stabbing someone, you just kind of like go stab them into the armpit. So that's what she does. Like she does like I'm a, like a performance or something, which would be cool because like that's what um Gabrielle is like. She's a poet music. So like maybe they come up with a scene, and oh. like, that's, that's like okay, so this is how you're going to fake your own death, and then people will sing about it, and then that's how the story of the legend will spread of how you died. Toss a coin to your witcher. Yes. Let's make it an actual bop. <laughs> Let us make it like a top 100 song. I, maybe it's just me. I can't imagine Xena faking her own death. Yeah, so is she living undercover for this entire series then? I don't know. Like, wouldn't it be much more like her to just be like, so, you know, I promised to marry you. I'm not going to do that. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> That would be a really cool way to do it. Is just she just keeps burning bridges in different areas, and so then, as she finds a new threat, another one's actually coming in as well. You know, like there's there's more stories you can do with that than just like I guess she's has to move in hiding now so that people don't know she's alive. You want her to like bewitch him with her coochie or whatever? Then she should just be like, hey. We won the battle. Let's go have sexy times. And then she stabs him. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was the route that I thought this was going to go was yeah. that Xena would set Ares up to die. Yeah. And or be horrifically maimed very like, like Hercules. Her, like yeah. Hercules. Yeah. Um, but like, and then like she now has control of an army, which good for you. Yeah. I love the phrase bewitch him with her coochie. That's really like what they were going for. <laughs> you nailed it. Mm -hmm. It took me a minute to come up with the word. All I could think of was bedazzle. And I'm like, that's not it. I want to see her bedazzle him with her coochie. <laughs> and just cover him with rhinestones. <laughs> and then he wakes up and she's gone. He's covered in rhinestones. He's like, what happened? 
It'll be a hard life, as a wandering bard and warrior, and woe unto them if Ares or Nayar were ever to find out that they escaped. But maybe they have done enough for their people. Oh god, like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Wait, so now Xena is like, what, how is this a redemption arc? Like, you got cured by pussy, weren't you listening? I like the line, but maybe yeah. they've done enough for their people. <laughs> like, you know what, good enough, let's go. <laughs> The only thing she can do is just do do good now on a day-to-day -day basis. But she doesn't deserve any mercy. All right, she's paying a debt she can never pay, and she'll always be paying 10 cents on the dollar. Is the writing supposed to be supporting the idea that, like, they have done enough and, like, that Xena doesn't really need to make amends? Gabrielle is like, okay, I have a responsibility to the safety of my people. I mean, she shouldn't run off into the sunset at the end or like, okay, run off into the sunset because you're not the princess. Meaning like this was never your responsibility to begin with. Why are you playing around at being warrior queen? You know what this is like? This is like that one Sailor Moon gif. You know, the one I'm talking about. <laughs> Guy in the cape. He's got the mask on. And he says, my job here is done. And they say, but you didn't do anything. And he's like, ha ha ha, and disappears. Also, yeah, I want, like, <laughs> I know it's stupid because, like, there is no explanation. But I want, like, further explanation of uh, Gabrielle's apotheosis as a warrior queen. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And maybe even a tainted soul such as Xena's deserves the happiness of true love. I, I feel like there is something to be said. I don't know that this particular project does it well, but there is something to be said for choosing to live, choosing, um, mm. Mm. choosing, uh, have you guys seen the new, or the Japanese Godzilla movie? Godzilla yes. Godzilla minus one, okay? <laughs> yes, Godzilla minus one. Right, the main character is a kamikaze, um, kamikaze pilot who, like, you know, chose not to, uh, do his quote-unquote duty so like the ending you know he's he's uh his plan is to sacrifice himself to defeat godzilla right but like at the last minute he you know he finds out that there is a parachute or option in his uh plane and he uses it and he chooses to live um so i i don't know i feel like part of the redemption isn't just you know sacrificing your life to fight or whatever part of it is also uh, choosing to live and to like live that. with like the ideals that you want to, I guess, change yourself yeah. to fit into. So I feel like that could definitely be like part of their quote unquote happy ending. Yeah. Instead of choosing, you know, this duty that's not hers because she's not the princess. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Zena, you know choosing to live and to redeem herself in that way instead of like dying if that's at least what they were going for that makes a little bit more sense i feel yeah. like i couldn't yeah. really wrap my head around what was even going on here but that is that could be a really nice arc like especially if she was in this like really extreme almost wanting to die for her sins or something and then realizing yeah. that like it's better and harder in a lot of ways to like live and just like slowly have that redemption arc rather than just like, you know, sacrificing your life and being like, that's good enough, right? Because, you know, when the, the original series starts, you see her burying her weapons in her armor and it's never fully confirmed about whether she's like going to try to live without weapons from now on or if she's going to kill herself. If her arc in this is this slow trajectory of realizing that... Now that she's not a warlord anymore, she's at loose ends and she's like desperately trying to find meaning in something or maybe even trying to find like a battle that will finally kill her off. That could be a potential character arc, this sort of fatalism where it culminates in this thing of realizing that she wants to live and like she can bring happiness to people through her life. Then I could see that being a fulfilling character arc. In a final emotional moment, the two women mount up and ride off into the sunset, leaving the war behind for a life of adventure. If you could try to come up with any, like, positives. 
I think that structurally there are good elements to this. I mean, that little heist part looked like it could be fun. That could be a fun episode. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of potential here, but I'm really, really skeptical that it would be anything that they could follow through on without making me go woof the whole way through, as we saw in the script. Um, There's a lot of women characters. <laughs> Not very well written women characters. <laughs> are there? I thought are, aren't there only three? Oh damn it! <laughs> okay, like the things that I really like. So if they more Callisto, like eighty percent Callisto stuff, <laughs> that would be. <laughs> and the the weird king guy, the whole subplot of like gabrielle being an abuse survivor i would prefer it that was like completely removed changed to something else not so many like marriages fake marriages all of that maybe so about her like the reboot isn't about xena at all but like this callisto person i would i would watch that she seems fun but see this this feels like what a lot of other shows i've seen do or use a whole season to set up what eventually becomes the show. I I would think like if they had made this like a silly camp, like fun romp of a thing, I would definitely watch it. But like this yeah. is like depressing and a little bit like confusing. Like I don't understand yeah. people's motivations. And when that happens, like I don't enjoy a story when I'm like, but why is this character acting like this now? Hire Emily. She's ready. Yeah. For the low, low price of you will get like an eight hour voicemail in response. <laughs> All right. We're going to get to the sex one in a minute. But first, we have to start with the historical inaccuracies. Do you know how long it would take to ride a horse? <laughs> I still think it ends better than the other one. That's fair. But you said this is, you think this is less likely to get made now than it ever was. The concept of the reboot, I feel, has changed a lot. And revivals, too. This is about 10 years old now. And I think we've had so many, and especially just, like, post-COVID, mm. it felt like that was the safe bet so many of studios went to. We had, like, Fuller House. We had the new Frasier show. Will and Grace came back for, like, a season. Uh, Beetlejuice 2 is coming out later this year. Um, basically, okay. Jenna Ortega is in a lot of things <laughs> that are reboots. <laughs> I think because the Lord of the Rings show on Amazon wasn't super successful. Wheel of Time wasn't successful. House of the Dragon worked, like, though. House of the Dragon was huge. So even if we're totally yeah. overloaded on reboots, revivals, and, you know, all, like, big, big budget fantasy, even if they're kind of gunshot, I think there's a lot of lessons they could learn from even stuff that didn't work. Like, the Obi-Wan series, the part of that series that worked was Ewan McGregor as an older yeah. Obi-Wan, and that's what most people were there for. So maybe... <laughs> Me fantasizing. Yeah. Maybe the lesson they can take from this is that it's time for a Xena revival, not a Xena reboot. I can dream. Act one, act two, really well, quotation marks, thought out. At least with those two acts, I saw where it was going, mm. right? I'm like, okay, okay, do I agree mm. with it? No. Do I think that you could still probably package this and sell this and get a decent amount of people to watch it? Yeah. Act three is so so messy i'm gonna be 100 percent honest here though if all of the removal of agency and the harping on sexual assault wasn't there and the characterization of xeno was on point i feel like i could forgive mostly everything else she didn't redeem herself at all any of this the only thing that she did was she was pussy hungry you know which like girl go for it <laughs> you know but like be honest about yeah it, it it just there was so many things that if you're not going to target that as your main theme of Xena being an awful person and yeah. trying to redeem herself yeah. and along the way help others to also redeem themselves, yeah. what's the point? The visuals. The look of the classic Xena warrior princess was lush and verdant, reflecting New Zealand filming locations and a lightness of tone full of production design pulling elements from different time periods to create a unified myth, a sense that all periods and legends could coexist in one world. Where the original presented a world of greens, blues, and browns, a world bursting with natural life, 
the color palette of this Xena will favor reds, oranges, and golds. Our new look will indicate the Bronze Era of Endless Conflict, an unsafe world where, in spite of the rise of civilization, wealth and power are the province of a privileged few, and the rest must fight for their ongoing freedom. The visuals of the retelling of Xena seek to evoke a sense that to be a woman, much less a woman warrior, in the world of archaic era Greece was a solitary and hard life. This was a world in which powerful men held sway, and only the very driven would survive. Following the lead of the classic Xena, we seek to make the point that the redemptive power of love and friendship transcends brute force and war. It's very My Little Pony. Let me ask you a very fair question. What do you do successfully? Quickly. I think that this was an attempt at depicting empowerment by purposely portraying the characters as overcoming great suffering and great injustice. But to paraphrase the discussion between myself and a good friend during our initial analysis of the leaked pilot script, the magic of the original Xena was that it was a power fantasy. And while a reboot doesn't have to tonally or thematically match the original, modern storytelling seems to think that a feminist power fantasy is surviving sexual assault when the actual power fantasy is never having to worry about it at all. The actual power fantasy, obviously, is being six feet tall with the power to kill the gods. <laughs> I think the evil King Eurus should be played by Jinx Monsoon. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx Monsoon for Hercules. Jinx Monsoon for Hercules. <laughs> so, Xena! <laughs> and she starts singing into Mama Knows Best from Chicago. Jinx Monsoon is Gabrielle. Oh my god, and then Bendela being Xena. <gasps> Bendela Creme for Xena! Yeah. We've cast it. We've cracked We've the code. Code. We've cracked the code. Just deep seated, buried misogyny. 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 <laughs> I can't talk. Misogyny. You can't make fun of anyone's pronunciation of anything. Maybe we're going to run into some aminals later. What do you call the word that means very big? How do you pronounce that word? <laughs> it's huge. It's fucking huge. I'm from New York. Go fuck yourself. What do you say if you're taking a tally of all the things in a store you're doing? I'm counting them. But what are you doing, though? You're taking... Counting. Just, just say it. <laughs> the, the inventory. <laughs> <laughs> the now mythical King Eurythse... Eurythse... Uh, the purpose of this reboot is to take those archetypal... Oh my god. Not again. I am killing it! This is so good! She was betrayed by a man, Hercules, who turned her own army against her and became Athens' greatest general. Wow, so rude. But no sooner have Xena and Gabrielle emerged from this ordeal that Callisto catches up with them. Hold on a second. I'm not sure that's grammatically correct. Let me fix that. Xena fights all the way to the Nayar's compound. The, the Nayar's compound? And renders him unable to ever fight again. <laughs>